All right, hello. I am back to read the next chapter of Root Magic, and it's been a little while. Um, we are going to be reading chapter five. So if we look back and think about what's been happening in the past, um, we know that she has started to learn a little bit about root magic with her brother. They are making hopes or wishes. They're hiding um, the little bags that they made in different places. And um, her family has been getting a hard time from, the I think, the previous police officer. And so the new one showed up and gave them... Um, kind of the feeling that he was trying to make a difference, but the parent, the mom wasn't really believing it yet. So we'll see. Um, we're going to get into chapter five, and here we go. When I came into the kitchen the next morning, Doc and Mama were both moving slower than usual, like they didn't get enough sleep. I understood because I didn't sleep last night either. The encounters with Deputy Collins and Sheriff Edwards had us all shaken up. I thought again of Grand Two. When she was living, Mama would sit with me and Jay and eat breakfast Grand cooked, then get up and head right for her food stall when she was finished. Now she and Doc had to get up earlier and cook, then clean up the kitchen before going off to work. Grand had left such a big hole in our lives to fill that I wondered if I could even be a drop in the bucket. So I know that there have been times in my life where I have been trying to make a difference in something and uh, it can feel really overwhelming, um, and she's she's really feeling that too, that there's this big challenge with her grandma um, having died and that missing piece, um, but realizing that every little bit you do makes a difference, and I think that's really important. Mama looked at me strange as I sat down at the table. You changed your hair, she asked. I nodded before digging into my bowl of buttered grits. At sunrise, I had gotten up and tugged a comb through my hair, then my best part down the middle. I put my hair up into two pigtails. I usually wore it in. Finally, I tied a white ribbon around each pigtail before twisting my hair and snapping a bread on each end. No way was I going to wear my hair out in curls again, not after Letty said I looked like some old lady. It was enough that I had to wear my old clothes at school, so I was going to stop trying to look pretty. There were more important things for me to worry about anyway. I thought the curls looked nice on you, Jazzy. Thank you, I said, but I like my pigtails. Mama frowned, but she only said, okay, as long as you're happy. She sipped her coffee, but tomorrow, let me be part of it so you will be a straight line. Glad I don't have hair to fool around with, Jay said, rubbing his hand over his head. You don't have brains up there either. Hush up, Jez. Both of you, stop it. Mama put down her cup. I want to talk about what happened last night. Janie, doctor started to say. No, let me finish. She put her hands down flat on the table. What happened last night and the day before doesn't change anything. You still need to go to school and do chores and everything else. This is not something for you two to be worried about. Just be extra careful when you're outside playing or going to and from school. Doc tapped his unlit pipe against his lips. We still have lessons, but stay alert, like I always tell you. Don't leave the other alone. Me and Jay agreed. It was the second time in two days we had police at the house. I hope there was something in that haint blue paint that would work on people. Finish up. It's time for school. Mama stood and refilled her cup with the water from the kettle. Go on. I got to get you two out of my hair this morning. We drank the rest of our tea, grabbed our books, and after a quick kiss on the cheek from Mama and a hug from Doc, headed out the door. Hey, I said as we ran down the steps. Do the boys at school tease you about Root? No, they think it's cool, but we don't talk a lot, except about ball and stuff. He gazed over at me. His wide eyes narrowed into little slits. Them girls bothering you? One of the new girls is. If she's new, then she don't know nothing about it. Jay rolled his eyes. Maybe Doc can teach us some kind of hex to put on her. He laughed, and I tried to force a smile. Letty might have been new to our school and to the island, but that didn't make what she said any easier to take. The other kids laughed when she made fun of me, which meant they agreed with her, or it meant they weren't going to stick up for me, which amounted to the same thing. So again, it's that idea of an upstander, right? If somebody's doing something that's unkind, we have a choice every time to just laugh and go along with it or um, make a strong choice. And it can be really hard and it's a skill to build, um, but even sometimes not laughing and just saying something like that's not nice can make a really big difference um, in people's lives. We took our normal path to school, but before we even got to the front gate, a group of boys called to Jay. One of them had a magazine with a plane on it, waving in the air. 
Jay whooped and followed behind his friends, leaving me to walk through the gate on my own. Letty and the other girls were already gathered on the lawn. I looked around for Susie, hoping for someone, anyone, who I could walk with. But if she was there, I didn't see her. I held my books tight, determined to ignore the girls as I walked past. As I got closer, Letty looked me up and down. She checked the watch on her wrist. Hey, it's the Wicked Witch of the South. You were almost late. Her sneer wasn't as bad as the one I got from Deputy Collins, but it was still pretty impressive. What happened? Did your broom break down? Everyone started giggling. I had no idea how Letty found out that my family worked root. Probably that local girl who whispered in Letty's ear told my uncle told my uncle was her witch doctor. Doc didn't mind the name, so I didn't either. I couldn't understand why the word made people so uncomfortable. Maybe it had to do with that song, Witch Doctor. That came on the radio sometimes. The last time I heard it, I listened to all the words, even that nonsense ones. And whoever wrote that song didn't know anything at all about witch doctors. And neither did Letty. My face felt hot, and the words came out of me before I could stop them. You don't know anything about root magic. That's not how it works. Ooh, Letty waggled her fingers in front of my face. Show us how it works, then. We want to see some of this magic, don't we? And she looked back at the other girls, and they laughed again. Shut up, Letty, I told her. She placed her hands on her hips. Is that all you can do? Tell me to shut up. You're still a witch, baby. Her laugh was loud, like our chicken squawking over the last bits of corn. I bet that stupid magic doesn't even work. It's the stuff only backwards country people believe. If I could, I'd make you disappear. I shouted in her face before stomping inside school. More chicken squawk laughter followed me. The bell hadn't rung yet, and so our hallways were almost deserted. Only a few teachers hurried by, barely glancing at me when they went into a room marked teachers only. I stood in the stuffy hall that smelled a little like bleach, closed my eyes, and breathed deep, calming myself down. I wanted to be able to work a spell on Letty to make her go away. Maybe I should just ask to go back to fifth grade with Jay. But then I thought Miss Watson wouldn't be my teacher anymore. I sighed and opened my eyes. Somehow, Susie had found me. She came up to me grinning. She was pretty and tidy looking with her crown of braids, just like yesterday. Hi, Jezebel. You okay? Hi. I shifted my books to one hip. I'm fine. Just Letty being a pain. Yeah, Susie replied, rocking back on the heels of her Mary Jane shoes. She's a nasty so-and-so, and I heard her parents talking to Miss Watson. They're all mean. I shrugged, not wanting to let Letty ruin my day. I wondered if I was going to get to see you walk into school today. Her eyes opened wider. They were shiny and reminded me of a black patent leather of Mama's pocketbook. So a pocketbook is like a wallet. Which way do you come? By way of the marshes? We could walk together. I mean, if you want. That'd be great. I usually walk with my brother, Jay, but he won't care if you come. I'd like that, she smiled warmly. Can I ask you a question? What Letty was saying out there about magic, what did she mean? The bell started to clatter. Susie and I started walking down the hallway to class. Would she make fun of me too? I didn't think so, but even if I could trust her, what was okay to tell her about root work and what wasn't okay? I should ask Doc what he thought. I'll tell you later. <clears throat> I waited all through the morning subjects, hoping Miss Watson might read us another of her favorite poems. The day was hot like the sun was breathing on us, but the windows of the school were open and a light breeze ruffled the papers on our desks. Finally, she opened that desk drawer again. This poem is by Gwendolyn Brooks, another Negro poet, she said, sitting on the edge of her desk again. I got the feeling it was her favorite reading position. A girl, Thomas said loudly. Gwendolyn is a woman, yes. Women can be poets, too. In fact, in 1950, she became the first Negro to win the Pulitzer Prize. Miss Watson opened the book. That's pretty much the biggest award they give for poetry. And she continues writing to this day. Isn't that something? Murmurs went through the entire class. I taught you about Shakespeare and his sonnets this morning. She continued clearing her voice. Well, now I'm going to read you one by Mrs. Brooks. This one is called The Sonnet Ballad. And it's one I read myself over and over again. I settled in my seat and waited for Miss Watson to begin her magic. Reading aloud sounds like something more for younger kids, babies almost, but it wasn't. That she chose one of her favorite poems to read to us made me feel like she was showing us something no other teacher had before. She was sharing part of herself, knowing that we might not like the same thing she liked, but doing it anyway. Her voice changed when she got to certain parts of the poem. 
It swelled up to fill the whole room with sound, and then it whispered softer than the wind through the trees. Our whole class hushed and listened, but I pretended she was reading only to me. I closed my eyes and let the sound of her voice wash over me, forgetting about the girls calling me names this morning. <clears throat> when me and Jay were almost home for school, we found Doc waiting for us at the top of the road. He wore a straw hat and a wide brim to keep off the sun. The tail of his white shirt flapped in the wind. He was twisting something around his hands. He nodded at us as we approached, then shoved the twisty thing in a bag he had thrown over his shoulder. How was school? Doc asked us. Fun, but not as good as this is going to be, Jay said, and Doc walked with us, with us down the road to our farm. How about you, Jess? Everything okay? Are those new girls still bothering you? Jay stuck his chin out. Yeah, but what can I do? They think Root is stupid and ignorant. My load of books felt heavier than usual, and I shifted the weight of them to my other arm. Doc sighed, long and deep. I'm afraid there will always be people, even other Negroes, who feel that way about root work, Jez. In fact, they would rather forget it. Why? Me and Jay asked about the same time. Well, maybe they think root work and other magics are like old-fashioned and only for uneducated people. Doc pushed his hat back on his head. Or maybe they don't want to remember our history because some of it's painful. Jay nodded. I could tell he remembered the other stories Grand told us about how white people treated her when she used to work in the city. They would shout at her and shove her as she walked to her job, and sometimes they even threw their drinks on her. But that's not all people, right? I thought of Susie, the question she asked this morning, like she was curious about root work. Not all people, Doc said, as we got up near the house. Crisp blue and white striped sheets were drying on the clothesline, snapping in the wind. Fat bees buzzed around us, dipping to sample flowers. But you need to be careful who you tell, like your mama told you, for your own protection. I'll try, I promised. Good, Doc smiled. And speaking of protection, that's what we're going to be continuing with for today's lesson. He handed me and Jay a small cloth pouch each. They had reddish brown dirt inside. Pour a little of it behind you as you walk. Make sure you have about half of it left when we get to the cabin. We did it as, as he said, sprinkling the dirt in our footsteps. Pour the rest of it in a circle around the cabin, Doc told us when we got there. One of you go right and the other left. Come back to me when you're done. We placed our books on the ground and ran around the cabin, using up the rest of the dust. Good, Doc nodded. You both did that real well. Jay frowned. Throwing dirt ain't that interesting. Yeah, I said. I was hoping we'd do something more exciting than painting this time. That wasn't any old dirt. Doc fixed us with a sly look. That was brick dust mixed with something special. Graveyard dirt. That caught our attention. Now that sounds interesting, Jay said. Doc laughed at him. It can protect anything, big or small. Best to always keep some of this made and close by. He opened his cabin door and we followed him inside. Then he showed us how to grind the brick pieces, then how much graveyard dirt to mix with it. Last, but most important, make sure you always leave a gift for the person whose grave you get the dirt from as payment. Otherwise, it's stealing. Doc, let's fill up our bags again from his supply. But he promised <clears throat> he wouldn't take us out to the set. He would take us out to the cemetery one day so we could gather dirt and make our own protection powder. No, I know you want to be doing more than painting houses and spreading dirt. You two grew up around me and your grand picking plants and herbs, making medicines and such. Yes, there's more to it, more than I've ever shared with you before. Some of it will be fun. Some of it will make you nervous. Some of it you won't like at all. But before we can get into those things, you need to learn the basics. Protect yourself. He looked at both of us in turn, and always take care of each other. Understand? Jay scowled his face up like he did when he had green beans for dinner. He hated them, but they were my favorite vegetable. Just show us how to curse somebody with a spell. Doc smacked him on the head with his rolled up newspaper. I laughed because I knew it didn't hurt. That's what I want both of you to hear me on, Doc said. If there's anything I learned in this life, that problems are going to find you. Problems I won't be able to prepare you for no matter how many spells I teach you. And the only thing that's going to get you through is your belief, your faith in yourselves, and your trust in each other. Nothing works without that. We both nodded, even though I'm pretty sure we didn't understand his full meaning. What else are we learning today, Doc? I was hoping to learn something, anything, that might protect me from Letty. 
I was pretty sure Miss Watson wouldn't be happy if I poured graveyard dirt around my desk. Jay rolled his eyes. Probably gonna have us scribbling, scrubbing floors or something. Doc took a jar of cloudy water out of his bag and placed it high up on the shelf. One day, you might have to do exactly that. Really? I asked my hands on my hips. Is cleaning house really part of root? Because it sounds like a way to get us to clean for you. Doc chuckled. I wouldn't leave you wrong, Desi. Oh, yeah? I lifted my eyebrows. What else are we going to do then? First, change your clothes. I already painted most of the house white while y'all were at school, but there's still a bit left, and you're going to finish that up. Jay was already groaning. But if you finish quick and do a good job, you can have the rest of the afternoon to play. I wanted to learn more spells, but getting most of the afternoon to play wasn't bad. We ran off, dodging the chickens, milling around the yard, tuck, tuck, tucking a food call to each other. We put on our play clothes, still splattered with paint from yesterday, then grabbed the brushes and went around to the house to the places we hadn't finished the day before. Most of it was done, except for under each window of the house. Hopefully we'd be done in time to play down in the marsh. I tried to keep the paint from dripping on me today, but it was no use. Jay soon had smears of paint over on his overalls and down his arms, so at least I wasn't alone. Mama could be mad at both of us. We worked together quietly until I remembered something and nearly dropped my brush. With grand passing, school starting, and starting our route training, I almost forgot. It's our birthday today! I know, Jay said. How are we going to celebrate without Grand making our cake? I shrugged. Do you think Mama and Doc got us anything? Mama and Doc had so much more to do now that Grand was gone. I wasn't sure if they even remembered. I don't believe they'd forget our birthday. Jay shoved his brush all the way down into the can of paint, getting blue all over his fingers. But we ain't got much money, especially with Grand's funeral and all. Yeah, already tired. I rubbed the sweat off my forehead with my arm. It didn't do any good. Heat surrounded us, hanging in the air still, coming up from the earth. I put the brush down and wiped my face on the hem of my skirt. The fabric darkened with my sweat and the dirt and dust clinging to my skin. But I bet she'll have something. When Doc came out of his cabin and up to the house, he stared at what we'd done. If you had turned like this when you first started painting, this whole house could be finished. We stood there side by side, silent, but proud that he saw the work we put in. Go on and play some now. Don't go too far, though. It's almost dinner time. We whooped and ran off past the plump, squawking chickens roaming the yard, away from the house and down the soft slope of farmland that ran along the woods. Doc's words were a memory as we found trees to climb and ran off the arches, or ran off the aches in our back from the work. Soon we got to the edge of the salt marsh that separated us from the ocean. Tall sea grasses bending and blowing in the wind, hot as bath water, forcing the bubbling scent of pluff mud into our noses. I'm going to get a hiding, a hiding man, Jay announced, kicking off his shoes on the grass and rolling up the ends of his overalls to his knobby knees. We love playing with baby fiddler crabs. They like to hide inside old spiral snail shells, but we knew how to get them to come peeking out of their hidey holes. And that's exactly what Jay, already ankle deep in the sucking mud, was doing. He bent down and plucked a shell from the grass. Then he put the open end of the shell to his throat and hummed long and low. He pulled it away and grinned, and I knew the crab's curiosity had made its wobbly eyes peer out. Can you get me one? I don't want to take my shoes off. Then you don't want a crab. Dog, bite it, Jay. I cursed in the only way Mama said was right for a lady, and I took my shoes off. I cursed for real when I saw the drops of blue paint on each of them. A quick glance at Jay showed he had paint on his left one, but not the other. Hopefully turpentine got paint off leather. I placed one foot on the black, brown black mud, the layers of mud, muck, had small holes all over it, where marsh grass breathed out. Larger holes showed where frogs and crabs and crawling things made their homes, protected from the burning heat of the sun. So that's kind of like at the beach here in Monterey um, and Seaside. You can tell where the sand crabs are because there's those holes in the sand, um, but just a different environment, a different habitat. Um, we can see the grass has the smaller holes and then the bigger holes for the other things. So kind of neat. Jealous of Jay's catches, he had two now. I took another step. For a moment, I stood there looking out at the marsh and listening to all of her sounds. Insects buzzing, crickets singing, bubbles popping on the surface. I smiled and stepped forward. Mother Marsh pulling at my ankles. Time. It was a voice as loud and clear to me as my own thoughts. 
I glanced around, expecting one of our neighbors from a nearby farm to be fishing on the water's edge. But no one was out there except for my brother comparing his two pets and choosing a winner to take home. Did you hear that? I asked. Jay wasn't listening, and I had to ask him again. Hear what? That voice, I said, annoyed. He looked back over his shoulder towards the house. Could it be Mama calling us? I don't think we can hear her way out here. If Mama wanted us, it was pretty sure we'd be able to hear her yelling if we were at the bottom of a pyramid way out in Africa. No, it was something else. Well, I didn't hear nothing. For true, I said. I was sure I'd heard something. It was getting late, and I didn't know how long we'd been out here, but the sun was dipping lower, and Mama would want us home for dinner before sunfall. We should probably be getting back soon anyway. Jay looked up into the sky, now stained with faded purples and pinks and hot orange. Yeah, he said drawing the word out like he didn't want to go. Finally, he put the hidden men in his pocket. He stepped towards me, lifting his feet high to get them free of the thick mud. As he passed me, I lifted my foot to follow him, but it didn't come up. I yanked it up again with no results. Jay, I said, I think I'm stuck. Shut up, Jazzy, and come. He started talking when he saw my face, or he stopped talking when he saw my face. I was pulling my leg up as hard as I could, but they weren't moving. Stop playing and pick up your feet. I can't. Jay grabbed me under the arms and yanked as hard as he could, making me think my arms would come out of the sockets. I squinched my eyes tight, but let him keep on. I was scared. At that moment, I wished I had Dinah with me. It's time. That voice came again, like the wind herself whispering to me. I didn't know what it meant, but it scared me even more. Did you hear that? That voice just now? Jay was still yanking on me. I don't hear nothing but your breathing and your hollering. But he had an idea. I'm going to hold on to you and you lift your right leg up, okay? I nodded, my throat tight. The marsh felt different somehow. Early September was always hot, but there was now a chill surrounding it, one that hadn't been there when we had stepped out a few minutes ago. My head felt light like it was trying to remember everything at once, then gave up. Jay grabbed me around my middle and held me straight while I tried to lift my leg. I pulled up hard, twisting as I did, but my foot wouldn't leave the ground. A frog croaked near me and my heart jumped. Go get Mama. No, I'm going to get Doc. He let me go and turned and squelched out of the marsh to the edge. I turned the best as I could to watch him go. He picked up his shoes from the marsh bank. A smear of light mud shaped like a handprint had dried on the side of the black leather, stopping where the wide splash of blue paint covered the top. Jay, let me see your shoe. He brought it over and handed it to me. I saw that the muddy fingerprints stopped before they reached the blue. It's the blue, I whispered. It really does work. A gust of warm wind blew over the marsh, tickling my neck. Do we have anything with a lot of paint blue on it? Jay still had the stick he'd used to stir the paint in his back pocket, and he took it out. That might work, I said. Shove it in the ground near my foot. Okay, he said. Ready? I took a deep breath, then nodded. Jay jammed the stick down into the mud next to my heel. Mud closed around the stick for a moment, then shrank away, leaving a small gap. I pulled my foot up, and my foot came out with a loud, sucking pop. With one foot free, I pushed myself back and sat my bottom on the edge of the grass. Jay wedged the paint-colored stick under my other foot, and the grip loosened enough for me to scoot all the way back to safe ground. I lay back down on the bank, breathing hard, looking up at the raw bacon sky, streaked with color. The sun was low now, making the shades richer and deeper, but the hot, moist wind was still heavy on my chest. My back was getting damp as I lay there, and it was only after a little while that I realized that my brother was calling my name. Yeah, I was free, but inside me I felt strange, like I'd lost something but couldn't remember what it was. He was silent for a moment, not looking at me, thinking, You okay? I wasn't sure. When Jay finally pulled my foot away from the march's embrace, I heard the voice again, and it said my name, Jezebel. Close to my ear, deep in my chest, I've heard it, whispery and slight. I'm okay. He stood up and brushed off his pants. Then we better get going. Oh my goodness. So we've seen that um, the blue really is a protection. What do you guys think it was? Do you think it's like a good thing or a bad thing? Ooh, I can't wait to see the next chapter. Um, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. I hope you're enjoying it, and I'll see you soon. Bye.